One day, Jesus was asked the question, which is the greatest commandment? Which commandment comes first of all? Jesus answered and said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The greatest commandment of all, according to Jesus, is that we love the Lord our God. So I want to ask you a question. It's the question we finished when I spoke to the children on the slides. It's the same question, and it's this. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Now, notice what I am not asking. I am not asking you, do you believe in Jesus? I'm not asking you if you follow Jesus. I'm not asking you if you are interested in Jesus. I'm not asking you if you love doctrine and reading big theological books. I'm asking you the question, do you love Jesus? That was the question that Peter was asked. And he was asked it by Jesus himself. We read it together a few moments ago. This incident takes place a few days, a short while after the resurrection. So Jesus has been crucified, he's risen from the dead, he's met the disciples on a number of occasions. And at this point, some of the disciples are in the north of the country and they've gone fishing with Peter. And you remember that Peter, by trade, was a fisherman. And while they're in the boat, they see Jesus on the shore. And Jesus is preparing breakfast. It's as though he's got a little fire, he's got some fish, he's got some bread. And they join him for breakfast. And after breakfast, Jesus and Peter go for a stroll along the shore of the lake. And as they're walking along and talking, Jesus asks this question, Simon, do you love me? Simon and Peter, they're two names for the same person. He asks the question three times. Why does he do that? Well, perhaps you remember what had happened just before Jesus was crucified. Peter had denied knowing Jesus three times. At the Last Supper, Jesus had said to the disciples that they would run away from him. And, and Peter, being Peter, he said, oh, no, 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 not me. No, no, I'll stick by you. And Jesus had to tell him that before the cock crowed in the morning, G Peter would deny him three times. When Jesus was arrested... Peter followed him to the high priest's house. He was watching what was going on and he's challenged three times. You're one of the disciples, aren't you? And on each occasion, he denied being a follower of Jesus. And after the third time, when the cock crows, Jesus turned and looked at him. I wonder what sort of look it was. A gaze of sorrow and disappointment. And Peter went out and Peter wept. He had denied his Lord three times. And so now Jesus comes and asks the question, do you love me? Three times. 
Now, if we look at the question as you find it in verse 15, in the first time he asks it, 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 it's slightly different. It says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? There are several ways we can take that question. I don't think Jesus is saying something like this. Do you love me more than these people love me? As though he's trying to have a competition. Which one of you can love me the most? I, I don't think that's what he's getting at. But it might be something like this. Do you love me more than you love these things? And, and imagine Peter, uh, Jesus rather pointing at the fishing boat, at the fishing tackle, at the catch that they've had. After all, that's what they've just been doing. They've been out fishing. Do you love me, Peter, more than your career? Do you love me more than your possessions? And how many people there are who put their job or their income or their promotion before the Lord Jesus? Or maybe it's their wealth, their possessions, the things they own, their comfort. Do you remember the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus recites the commandments. And the young man says, well, I keep those commandments. And then Jesus looked at him and Jesus realized something about him and told him, go and sell all that you have, give it to the poor and come and follow me. And that man went away downhearted. Because he was wealthy. And that wealth had a grip upon his soul. Well, what about the farmer in the parable? Who had a bumper crop. More crops than he could store. So he builds bigger barns. And he stores everything. And he goes home and he puts up his feet. And I always picture him with a, a, a glass of wine. And his feet up by the fireside. Just sitting back. I can retire. I can take it easy. And then God speaks to him, you fool. Tonight your soul is required of you. And he'd spent all his life and all his effort farming and doing a good job. And he neglected his own soul. And even as Christians, we can be lured along this path, can't we? where we make the things of this world of greatest importance. So Jesus is saying something like this, do you love me more than these things? Do you love me, Peter, more than the things I give to you? Because sometimes we can be quite clever, can't we? And we justify our love of things by saying, well, of course, they're God's blessings to us. And that's true. Every good thing we have is a gift of God and is given to us to be enjoyed with thanksgiving. Even on the spiritual level, there are the blessings of salvation, aren't there? Joy and peace and having a purpose in life. But do we love what the Lord gives to us more than we love the Lord himself is it a clear conscience that we want more than wanting Jesus is it heaven and eternal life we want more than seeing and being with Jesus do you love me more than these things or another way we could take it, the question is do you love me more than you love these people? And after all, there were the disciples and his friends around him. Do you love me more than you love your friends? Do you love me more than you love your family? Do you love me more than that relationship you've set your heart upon? 
Is your satisfaction to be found in human relationships, horizontal relationships? Are your children more important to you than Jesus? And Jesus once put it like this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Strong language. The word hate has been used as a comparison, but Jesus is deliberately using strong language to make us sit up and listen. How often do you read that when you're reading your Bible? And as soon as you see that word hate, you, you immediately say to yourself, I wonder what he really means by that. Well, that's the point, isn't it? He's trying to get you thinking about it. And the point he's making is this. Who comes first? Jesus or somebody else? And remember that there are those around the world for whom should they become Christians? They are saying goodbye to their family. Goodbye to their husband or wife. Goodbye to their children. The price of following Jesus is to lose their family. What price? Jesus. So here's the question then. Do you love Jesus more than you love any other thing, more than you love any other person? Do you love Jesus most? That is the question that Jesus was putting to Simon Peter. And it's the question that he is putting to each one of us this morning. Do you love me? Well, what does it mean then to love Jesus? I want to give you several answers to that question, what it means to love Jesus. Jesus. First, if we love Jesus, we will put Jesus first. If we love him, we'll put him first. He will be the number one priority in our lives. Being where Jesus is will be our greatest desire. We will most want to be there. And where has he promised to be? He has promised to be when the church gathers together. When the church come together in the name of Jesus, where two or three even are gathered in the name of Jesus, he has promised to be there with them. And so if we love him, we will do all that we can to be where he is, to be in the gathered fellowship of his people in the body of Christ now I know that there are many times when we genuinely can't we might be ill we might be traveling we might be having to work whatever it is but the point is that if we can we will be there and if we can't we'll miss being there As David puts it in the Psalms, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. If we love Jesus, we will put him first. <clears throat> Secondly, if we love Jesus, we will hear him with pleasure. Uh, maybe some of you have got relatives who live a long way away in another country. Uh, I've got relatives who live in New Zealand. I don't think you can get much further uh, away than that. But imagine you've got these relatives a long way away and then you get that phone call from them. Or these days, that Zoom call from them or whatever technology you would like to use. But you want to hear from them. 
You want to know what's going on. You want to hear what they've got to say for themselves. You're glad to hear their voice. God speaks to us in his word in the Bible. And so if we love God, if we love Jesus, we will delight in his word. And we will delight in the preaching of his word. And we will gladly turn to our Bibles in order to hear his voice. And we will sit ourselves under godly, Christ-centred, biblical preaching. But when we come to the Bible, when we read it, we read it to meet him. We don't read it simply to fill our heads with knowledge. We don't read it simply to tick off today's chapter in our reading plan. We don't read it merely to prepare next week's sermon. We come to the word to meet the one that it's all about. The Lord Jesus Christ. He himself taught that the word, the scriptures are all about him. These are the words that testify about me, he said. He, he shows them, the disciples, how all through the scriptures they were speaking of the coming Messiah, of Jesus himself. The Jews didn't receive him because they wouldn't believe the word. So do we read our Bibles to meet Jesus? Because if we love him, we will. Thirdly, if we love Jesus, we will follow him and obey him. Isn't that how Jesus called the first disciples? Follow me. Isn't that what Jesus says to Peter here in verse 19? Follow me. A disciple will follow Jesus and follow in his ways. We will walk as he walked. We will, as it were, put our feet in his footsteps. We will love the things that he loves. We will value what he values. We will do what he says. We will go where he sends us. In John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. Our obedience is a sign of our love. And true love sticks with him through thick and thin. And it was because Peter hadn't stuck with Jesus through thick and thin that Jesus was coming to him now and asking these questions. Do you love me? But the fact that, as Peter says, you know that I love you. The love of Peter for his Lord is shown in his future life where he goes on to serve him faithfully, even to the point of dying for him. That's what verse 18 is all about. That one day he will stretch out his hands and another will dress him and carry him where you do not want to go this Jesus said to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. He would lay down his life for his law. Following Jesus is not an easy road. It is the road of suffering. It is the road of disappointment. It is the road of carrying our cross. But it is also the road that leads ultimately to glory in his presence. Next, if we love Jesus, we will trust him. If we love him, we will trust him. Now trusting him, of course, means that in the first place we trust him for salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. 
We turn from our sin in repentance and turn to him in faith in order to receive mercy and forgiveness, grace, eternal life, the Holy Spirit and heaven to come. We put our lives in his hands, not just for that moment, not just for today, but forever and ever for all of eternity. We put our trust in Jesus for salvation. But trusting Jesus is not merely about being saved. It's about trusting him day by day through our lives. It's trusting him in the bad times as well as in the good times. Will you trust Jesus when he calls you to walk the darkest valley? As you look at your calendar, as you look at how the months stretch out ahead of you, will you trust Jesus? Will you trust Jesus if he calls upon you to walk the road of suffering and illness? Will you trust Jesus if he calls you to walk the road of bereavement or loneliness? Will you trust Jesus if he calls you to a life of poverty, of loss, of financial hardship? Will you trust Jesus if it means persecution, mockery, losing your friends? One man who trusted God in the bad times was Habakkuk. He could say this, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. What about Job? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. If we love Jesus, we will trust him. If we love Jesus, we will glory in the cross. God forbid that any Christian should be ashamed of the cross of Calvary. We look at that cross. We look at it with tears in our eyes. Because the one who hangs there is the one that we love. The one who suffers there is our beloved Saviour. But at the same time, we can also look at the cross, can't we? And our hearts swell with joy because there at Calvary, Jesus wins our salvation. There he secures our forgiveness. He died on that cross for me. He bore my sin. He paid my penalty. He died in my place. We're not Christians, are we, because of what we have done? Because of what we have achieved? We're Christians because of what Christ has done. His life, his death and his resurrection. And we look to him alone for mercy. It's grace, isn't it? Grace alone. And as we look at that cross, aren't our hearts drawn out to the Saviour? How can you think of Calvary and not be moved? How can you think of the cross and not be stirred? By the love that Jesus has for sinners like us. If we love him, we will glory in the cross. If we love Jesus, we will delight 
in him. Rejoice in him and desire him. Psalmist says, whom have I in heaven but you? And earth is nothing I desire besides you. It's this desire for the Lord. And I think this begins really to get us down into the heart of what it means for us to love Jesus. He should be our chief delight. That we desire nothing more than we desire him. We rejoice in him. We're glad to know him. And there needs to be this emotional response. What sort of love is it for anybody that is merely cold and intellectual? Here it's an emotion. It's love for Jesus himself. Tell me, does Jesus excite you? Does Jesus thrill your soul? Do you want to know him better? Do you love to hear about Jesus? Do you love to speak about Jesus? Do you want other people to know him like you know him? Do you delight in him? Is he your heart's desire? If we love Jesus, we will delight in him. We will enjoy him. We will rejoice in him. If we love Jesus, we will worship him with gladness. Loving Jesus doesn't mean that we somehow bring him down to our level and just treat him as our best pal. He is still our God. He is still our Saviour. He is still the maker of heaven and earth, the giver of life. He is the one we worship. He is our eternal saviour. And he's worthy of all our praise and all our adoration. Around the throne in heaven, they're singing these words, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. And all the saints in heaven are gathered together around the throne and they're all bowing down to Jesus and they're all worshipping him. And we join in that worship, even on a Sunday morning like today. Our worship is part of that as we adore our Saviour. So let us lift up our hearts and our voices in praise and in thanksgiving. Let us glory in Christ. Let us never be afraid to acknowledge him. Rejoice in the Lord always, says the Apostle. Again I will say, rejoice. And then, lastly, if we love Jesus, we will long for his presence and for his coming. If somebody you love has to go away on a business trip, on a military deployment or something like that, you miss them. You want them back. And you count down the days, you tick them off on the calendar, knowing that that's the day they're coming back, and you're waiting for that day. One day Jesus is coming back. And we are to be looking forward to the return of our Lord.
And it should excite us that he's coming back. And it should fill us with anticipation. We should be like little children waiting for Christmas Day as we wait for Jesus to come. Paul puts it like this. We're to be eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Eagerly waiting. Is that us? Is that you? Is that me? Do we long for the coming of Jesus? Do we pray our Lord come? Now that doesn't mean that we just sit round waiting, 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 twiddling our thumbs, waiting. No, we've got work to do. We've got a mission that he has given to us. To go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. To take the good news of Jesus Christ to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We have a job to be doing, a mission to fulfill, to take the gospel to everyone we can. But as we do that, we watch. And we wait. And we look for him. And we cry out, O oh Lord, come. And when that day comes, we shall be like him. We shall be transformed. We shall see him as he is. And we shall be with him for all eternity. And what a day that is going to be when Jesus calls us home. So this is what it is to love Jesus. We will put him first. We will hear him with pleasure. We will follow and obey him. We will trust him. We will glory in the cross. We will delight in him. We will worship him with gladness and we will long for his coming. Do you love Jesus? Imagine that you are walking along the beach and he turns to you and he says to you, do you love me? How are you going to answer him? Search your heart now. Do you love Jesus? Is he everything to you? Would you give up everything that you have for him? Including your life. Because this is what it is to be a Christian, isn't it? To be somebody who loves Jesus for himself and not just for what he gives us. It is to long for him. It is to live for him. Is that you? Do you love Jesus? Amen. Amen. Amen.